This is a presentation on Samuel Plato, his roots, his times, and his legacy. I first wish to acknowledge all of the various organizations and individuals that have has assisted with information on putting this presentation together. And I especially want to thank Darnell Ferris and Martina Kanaki for their assistance with this presentation. This could not have happened without their dedicated and passionate involvement. I am Steve Weiser. I'm a local Ar Louisville architect, as well as historian. I'll begin Samuel Plato, his roots, his times, and his legacy. This is a 1910 article uh, that features a uh, African-American uh, business conference. Uh, Samuel Plato would have been about 28 years old when he attended this event. And he is quoted within this article. He basically is saying that uh, he wants people to uh, uh, do for themselves and to go go uh, and, and do right and make a good uh, success with their lives. Um, he says, fill yourselves up with the invigoration, invigorating con conception of success. And that's what he was about, was going out. He did not take no for an answer. He actually uh, overcame many obstacles in his life. And we'll be discussing those throughout this presentation. First, we'll discuss his uh, early upbringing and educational background. He was born in Waugh, Alabama on January 10th, 1882. His parents were James and Katie Plato, and they named him after Samuel Carter, one of the most respected African-American builders and craftsmen of their era. James, his father, was not only a farmer, but also a skilled craftsman and artisan. At age eight, Samuel was well-trained in the tools of the construction trade. And by the, the age of 17, he had built his first building. He was also skilled in cabinet making, carpentry and basic design. However, with all these skills, he still preferred to be a lawyer. This is a, a 1900 U.S. Census of Wall, Alabama. And I'll enlarge this one area here of the Plato family. He had, um, it looks like, five sisters and a brother, at least one brother, um, there, per the census information. And if you look more closely at it, it indicates that he was born in 1879. We'll discuss this discrepancy later in the program. While Alabama is located between Tuskegee and Montgomery, Alabama, in the southeast corner of the state, is mainly known, while Alabama is mainly known for Lucas Tavern, where Marquis de Lafayette once dined on April 2nd, 1825. Plato uh, early education was steeped in what is called the Tuskegee spirit. Booker T. Washington recommended that Cornelia Bowen, one of Tuskegee's first graduates, open Wall's Mount Meigs Colored Institute. Not only did Plato attend Mount Meigs, but he graduated with honors. His father, James, helped design and build the school, which is depicted here in this photograph. The Tuskegee spirit was, it was and still is a major force in the African-American experience. You see uh, Booker T. Washington there in the upper right-hand corner and lower center was George Washington Carver, very well-known Tuskegee members. And of course the Tuskegee Airmen who, who uh, served uh, heroically 
in the uh, Second World War. The African American community valued education greatly. However, Plato did want to be a, an attorney, a lawyer. From Mount Miggs, Plato spent a year at Western Industrial Acad Winston Industrial Academy in North Carolina. He wanted to attend Tuskegee, but couldn't afford the tuition. Like many of his contemporaries, Plato decided to seek his fortunes elsewhere and ended up in Louisville, where he enrolled at State University in 1898. He dropped out for a year to return to Alabama and teach. For those unfamiliar with State University, it actually opened as Kentucky Normal Theological Institute in 1879. Then it became the State Colored Baptist University in 1881 changed its name to State University in 1883, and finally St Simmons University in 1921. Today, we know it as Simmons College of Kentucky, which still exists. After a year in Alabama, Plato returned to State University. To pay for his room and board, he hired himself out to build furniture, repair campus buildings, and do general carpentry work. Near Bardstown, he built a house for one of his university professors. While at State University, Samuel met and courted Nettie Lusby, the daughter of Thaddeus Lusby and Emma Parrish. They married in 1903. You see their marriage certificates there. In the lower left-hand corner, are the Lusby children. They had four daughters, and Nettie is depicted there on the left. <clears throat> Somewhere along the way, Samuel completed an international correspondence school course in architecture. And after completing his studies at, at State, Samuel and Nettie relocated to Marion, Indiana. There they would live and build a business for the next two decades. Historically though, Indiana was a challenging place for African-Americans uh, to set down roots. Uh, there uh, you see the 1910 census uh, data where uh, Samuel and Nettie are listed as residents of Marion, Indiana. So that was the early education and history of Samuel Plato. Now let's talk a little bit more about his career. As noted, he moved to Marion, Indiana, which was located northeast of Indianapolis. And why Indiana? Well, it was a challenging place for African Americans to, to live, especially because of public hostility and the laws there in Indiana at the time. Most notable was Article 13 of the Indiana Constitution, which stated, no Negro or mulatto shall come into or settle in the state after the adoption of this constitution. Additional legislation required all blacks already living in Indiana to register with a circuit court clerk. Long after such laws and conventions faded away, cultural attitudes lingered as Plato soon discovered and later described while at a National Negro business conference. So uh, the text that you see there on the right basically indicates that uh, Plato decided to be a carpenter in Marion. He only had $2.40 in his pocket. He was working on a schoolhouse when the foreman came around one day and said he would have to dismiss him from working there. Plato asked, was it because of the quality of his work? No, said the foreman, it was because of my color. The white carpenters refused to work with me. I then went to them and said, someday you will come to me for a job. And this prophecy will later be borne out. So again, why uh, did uh, Samuel and Nandy go to uh, Indiana? Well, number one, it was a prosperous area. Uh, they had just found natural gas there. And there was a wealthy benefactor who believed in Samuel's work. 
so it changed their lives. Marion was also strategically located for him to find jobs in other nearby states. Here's a list of uh, buildings that we've been able to identify and attribute to Samuel Plato that were built in Marion, Indiana. Uh, this uh, nice aesthetic church, if you look closely at it, you'll notice some of the architectural detailing that we'll be referencing on later churches of this design. This was the first Baptist church in Marion. Also, uh, this more modest church, the second Baptist church by, by Plato and built in 1905. The Platonian Apartments. Uh, in Marion, which was a residential complex. It had a lot of um, design features that were popular at the time, the extended eaves of the roof system, the banding of the uh, masonry and uh, this upper story there, very similar to the uh, craftsman period of that time. Samuel also was uh, specialized in modest, affordable housing that he felt that young people could buy and own as their own home. Here's a more um, expensive example of housing that uh, Samuel helped build. And he designed in a variety of uh, eclectic architectural styles. Here's a bungalow type of, uh, of house, but he also did, uh, as noted earlier, craftsman style, traditional style homes. Um, he was not wedded to one particular style. He was very uh, affluent in various styles and, and designs. Here's a more Tudor style home that he created. And this more elaborate Tudor style home, uh, I think this was uh, recently purchased perhaps by the Indiana Landmarks. I think it's undergoing restoration and um, very creative design, a lot of detailing here. Fortunate that this uh, house has been saved. He also worked on the uh, J. Wardrow Wilson house also known as the Hostess House in Marion. J. Woodrow Wilson was a vice president of the Marion National Bank. Thus, Samuel was very well known in the business community there in, in Marion. This is a side view of the Woodrow Wilson House. And Samuel designed a, an odd fellows hall in Marion. Unfortunately, this project was never implemented. So why did uh, Plato leave Marion, Indiana? It became very uncomfortable in the 1920s and 30s when the uh, Ku Klux Klan um, came into power. Over 250,000 Hoosiers um, were known to be in the Klan's ranks at that time. So for African Americans, it was not a very pleasant place to live uh, during the early 1900s. By the end of 1930, Marion, Indiana could make two claims. It had been the home of the country's most prolific Arctic architect, but it was also the inspiration for a song known as the Strange Fruit for the notorious lynching of two black men who were um, taken from the Marion City Jail and hung. The um, song, the singer Bailey Holiday made this uh, song popular in the 1930s and 40s. Following their relocation to Louisville, shortly thereafter, Nettie Plato 
died of tuberculosis while in Kentucky. This is her uh, death certificate that's indicated here. Very tragic time for, for Samuel. A year after Nettie's passing, Samuel married Elnora Davis Lucas, who also became his office manager and accountant. Here's a uh, photograph of the office. You see Samuel standing there on the right-hand side and Elnora overlooking a staff member. Here's a list of uh, buildings in Louisville, Kentucky that we've been able to identify as Samuel Plato projects. One of his uh, noted works is St. Augustine Catholic Church near the intersection of Broadway and 12th Street near downtown Louisville. Here's an interior view of that same church. Almost right across the street is perhaps Samuel Plato's more landmark church structures, the Broadway Temple AME Zion Church. And on its cornerstone, if you look at the very lower portion of it there, it says S.M. Plato, architect. I put some text on there to highlight that text. Perhaps uh, Samuel Plato is the only architect that I'm familiar with that has a, a stained glass window in a church designated to him. Also on this stained glass uh, window is an uh, image of uh, Nettie Plato as an angel. Here is the uh, Broadway Temple under construction. And this is another religious structure by Samuel Plato, the James Lee Memorial Presbyterian Church, which is in the Clifton neighborhood of Louisville on Frankfurt Avenue. You notice uh, again, the aesthetic architectural features. This is uh, some interior photographs. Uh, this church building uh, no longer is for worship. It actually now has been turned into a residential structure. And I do not believe this sanctuary still exists. I think it's all been turned into uh, living units. Some more interior photos of the former church. It's a side view. And so here we bring them all together. Um, the first Baptist church, that I showed earlier that was in Marion, Indiana, in the upper right-hand corner, James Lee Memorial Church there in the Clifton neighborhood, and lower center is Broadway Temple AME Zion. And you can definitely tell Plato's uh, aesthetic features to combine all those churches together. One of his more major projects occurred on 7th Street at Kentucky, where he took some a residential area there with some of these cottages and built a substantial building for Simmons College, this boys dormitory that you see here in this illustration. And here it is as it was built. Here it is while it was under construction. I'm certain that Samuel was there that day. He may be up on the dedication platform there um, due to the long distance photographs. We really cannot tell who was there, but I'm sure Samuel was up towards the front. So uh, Samuel Plato designed several buildings at Simmons College, uh, Stuart Hall and Parish Hall. He also did the Wood Axton Hall that's depicted here.
He um, designed Green Street Baptist Church, which was in the Phoenix Hill neighborhood of Louisville, just to the east of the University of Louisville Hospital. This building here, um, many said were de was designed by Samuel Plato. It's the Knights of Pythias Temple, now known as the Chestnut Street YMCA. However, on further research of this building, we have found that the National Register of Historic Places indicate it was designed by architect Henry Walters. This is the National Register form. And you'll see that uh, Henry Walters is definitely listed as the architect of the Pythian building. So why is Samuel Plato associated with this building? And why do people indicate he designed it? Here's another article. And it lists that the, the firm of um, Nevin and Morgan uh, renovated it into the YMCA. But again, a lot, of, a lot of folklore indicates that Samuel Plato designed this building. So what's the history of this? Well, it turns out that Samuel did design a YMCA for the Chestnut Street branch. This is the illustration that he did. And you can see uh, in the lower portion there, it says Plato and Evans Architects. So he did design a building for the YMCA, but it was never built. So you can compare the two designs. The one on the left, the, the Knights of the Pentheus Temple by Henry Walters, and then Plato's design there on the right that was not constructed. Plato did design the Mammoth Life Insurance Building on Muhammad Ali, uh, just west of 6th Street. However, it still exists, but you would never know it because it has been since covered up by this metal facade over the top of it. Hopefully someday River City Bank will take off this facade and restore Plato's fine design. He also designed the Virginia Avenue School original building. It's now known as the West End School. Uh, the red roof structure that you see there in the upper photograph is the original building that Plato designed. He also did the Washburn building in the Parkland neighborhood at 28th and Duman Hill. It has retail below and residences above. Samuel um, designed many houses in West Louisville. Many of them were, were affordable homes, but he also did some more elegant and elaborate homes as well, as depicted here at the Hammond House on West Madison Street in Louisville. This is Plato's own house at 25th uh, in the 2500 block of West Muhammad Ali Boulevard. Uh, the house is uh, slightly deteriorated and we are watching it and we hope that someday it will be for sale and we can purchase it and restore it to its prom prominent place in uh, Samuel Plato's history. As noted earlier, uh, Samuel had numerous challenges um, in his practice. And one of them was the depression era that was happening in the late 1920s and 1930s and 40s. Uh, and so Samuel Plato went where the work was. Here is the 1930 US census. And according to this, uh, Samuel and Elnora were living in New Philadelphia, Ohio at the time. Other buildings that um, Samuel Plato worked on, he worked on projects in Maryland, Washington, DC, Ohio, and Indiana. More substantial buildings that Plato both designed and possibly built as well. Don't exactly know if he just designed them and built them or if he built them after another architect's plans, but he was involved in all these projects. 
And while he uh, designed uh, uh, many different styles of buildings from religious buildings, residences, schools, office buildings, perhaps his biggest claim to fame is all of the projects he did for the United States Postal Service. He designed up to 38 US post offices, primarily in the uh, Northeast United States. As noted, he was the first African-American architect to design a US post office. We've been able to identify about 28 of his designs thus far. Here are representative examples of some of his post offices. The one in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, not exactly certain that he designed that, but he more than likely built it. Um, he could have easily have designed the other two post offices that are depicted here. More uh, post offices in New York State that he uh, more than likely designed and built. Uh, one of, in the Xenia, Ohio there in 1913, post office. Again, not certain if he was the design architect, but he was involved whether it was through the design or at least the construction of this. The uh, Decatur, Alabama uh, post office has a interesting tale of its relationship to Samuel Plato. When the postal service there in Alabama hired him to design this post office, they were unaware that he was an African-American architect. And when he came down to Decatur to do a field site visit, the contractor was dismayed that he was now working with an African-American architect. And thus Samuel went back to Kentucky and did not make any more construction visits to Decatur to oversee this project. Again, some of the challenges that Samuel had to face in his career. Here in Morgantown, West Virginia, Plato is known primarily for the addition to this structure that you can see off the back side of this uh, large postal building. Obviously, besides the challenges of designing and building projects, Samuel Plato had to overcome many obstacles, not only the KKK, but also Jim Crow laws and the Depression. Fortunately, his wife, Elnora, was, was a partner with his success. She was a talented dressmaker and prevented Samuel from going bankrupt at least once in his career. You may have seen the movie, The Green Book, and via that movie, understand more about the, uh, the obstacles of African-Americans traveling throughout the South during this Jim Crow period. And Samuel was involved in a variety of lawsuits as well, whether it was uh, contractors suing him for materials or whether he suing uh, filing lawsuits against clients for payment of his projects. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the, uh, the hazards of being in the architecture and construction business. You do have lawsuits, lawsuits to deal with, and Samuel was not immune to those. Here's an interesting uh, story of uh, Samuel Plato's career. He had to uh, implement a significant military project uh, during the 1940s. And uh, as such, he had to um, get a million dollar loan. He went into the bank and asked the bank president for this loan. And the bank president thought about calling the police or having him committed to an insane asylum, he said. However, uh, again, he was working for the Defense Department. Unfortunately, the, he was able to uh, obtain the loan and finish the project in a quality manner. So um, sure, not many bank presidents have African-Americans coming into their establishment asking for million dollar loans. But Samuel was up to the task, was able to implement the project. Nice, pride, nice photograph of Samuel on the far left and Elnora on the right uh, while in Washington, D.C. As noted earlier, uh, Samuel uh, specialized as well in modest, affordable housing. This is a, a 36 housing complex that he did 
uh, in Louisville known as Ford Place. Photograph of Samuel with Eleanor Roosevelt, who congratulated him and recognized him for building affordable housing. Eleanor and Samuel talking. I think that might be Eleanor there in the center. Elnora. So concluding our talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about his legacy. Following his passing, um, Howard University recognized his career and installed a uh, painting there on their campus. I think that is Elnora holding the painting there. Samuel wanted to inspire the next generation of architects and engineers. He wanted to serve as an example. As noted here, he um, was excellent in what he did. Uh, he not only was an asset to his African-American race, but as well as to Louisville. Very proud citizen of Louisville. He enjoyed interaction with the younger generation, trying to inspire them and excel in whatever profession they chose to do. That's uh, Elnora there standing beside Samuel there on the right. Interesting photograph of uh, many um, African-American contractors and professionals here at this conference in Virginia. We believe Samuel Plato was at this conference, although we do not see him in this photograph. However, someone that is depicted in this photograph is Ethel Bailey Furman, who is the first woman African-American architect in Virginia. She's very accomplished and achieved many great projects during her career. Plato implemented projects in nine states as well as the District of Columbia. He also has nine projects on the National Register of Historic Places. This is a timeline of significant events in Samuel's life. Born in January 10th, 1882. Came to Louisville uh, in 1900 to State College. He married Nettie Lesby in 1903, and they moved to Marion, Indiana in 1905. They built a variety of projects while there. Got his first post office project at the age of 31 in 1913. Built a number of churches and returned to Louisville, worked for Simmons College. Unfortunately, Nettie uh, passed away at the age of 42 in 1924 of tuberculosis. He married Elnora Davis Lucas in 1925. Samuel passed away on May 13th, 1957. This is his obituary or article, as well as his death certificate. He died of cerebral hemorrhage. This is his burial location in Louisville Cemetery, which is on Poplar Level Road, just south of Eastern Parkway. He's buried next to Minnie Scott, who was an aunt to Elnora. However, you'll note that Elnora's information is missing. The reason for this is that Elnora is actually buried in Laurel, Maryland where she passed away. She was uh, 80 years old. So one of the mysteries of Samuel Plato's um, life is what does the M stand for in his name? 
when you look at his war registration information, you'll note that it just says M. Well, we believe that M really didn't stand for any specific name, although we think it might have referenced Marion, Indiana, where he was living at the time. Very similar to Harry S. Truman, the S did not stand for anything in Harry S. Truman's name either. So the M, we think, stood for Marion, and Samuel, due to his uh, army registration, had to have a middle name, so he just put an M down. And you'll also notice, oh, let me go back just a second, the, the, the different birth years listed here. On one, it says 1882, another says 1884, and as referenced earlier, uh, the 1900 census indicated 1879. So what year was Samuel Plato uh, born in? Well, this historic marker in Marion, Indiana sort of leaves a little flexibility by saying it was circa 1882, indicating that it could be 1879 or 1884, but 1882 somewhat in the middle there. And so we leave it at that. And that's what's on his uh, headstone as well. This marker denotes a lot of his achievements. And on the flip side of this marker, it talks about a lot of the challenges that he faced as an African-American architect in a construction field that was dominated by, by many whites. In Louisville, we installed historic marker in front of his landmark uh, Broadway Temple AME Zion Church. And that is the marker there. We're very proud of Samuel Plato's legacy and want to make sure we highlight his career. He was a shining example during the 1900s, during very harsh times for African Americans. And he excelled at what he was doing and uh, created a lot of phenomenal projects. So we are very thankful for Samuel Plato, along with Elnora and Nettie, uh, who assisted him during his career. Thank you for attending this uh, presentation of Samuel Plato. If you have any questions, please email me here at this email address, wiserfaia at outlook.com. Thank you for attending, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation of Samuel Plato, architect.